Hi AP Statistics students, this is Ms. Skoken and we're going to be taking a look at Chapter 2, Modeling Distributions of Data. In Chapter 1 we focused on looking at individuals within a data set, looking at categorical and numerical variables, making sure that we could allow the distribution of the variables to tell a story through a graph and through numerical descriptions. In Chapter 2, we're going to be focusing on an individual within a data set. We want to know where they stand. And that's called describing location in a distribution. After this section, we should be able to measure position using percentiles. This is something you're probably already familiar with. Interpret cumulative relative frequency graphs. Measure position using a measurement that we have not yet talked about, the z-score transform data, define and describe density curves. So what does a percentile mean? This is something that you are familiar with already. When you get a test back, let's say you're sitting in class, you get a test back and you get a 75 on the test. If you immediately start asking all of your peers sitting around you what they got and they got 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s, then your 75 looks really good and you're very pleased about the 75. But if when you ask your peers they tell you that they got 80s and 90s and 100s, then you start to feel a little bit sad about your 75 and you wonder what went wrong. So what we do is we use percentiles to help us to put our position wherever, wherever whatever the individual is that we're interested in put it in a place and our definition is the pth percentile of a distribution is the value with p percent of the observations less than it. So this again is something that we're familiar with. For example, Jenny earned a score of 86 on her test. How did she perform relative to the rest of the class? Well we can see that Jenny's score of 86 is the one in bold on the stem plot and it is greater than 21 out of the 25 observations. So 84% of the scores are below Jenny's. That means she measures in at the 84th percentile in the class's test score distribution. A cumulative relative frequency graph is something that we've talked about before, an ogive. And when we talked about frequency distributions, we talked about ogives because it fits right in. And what we do is we calculate the cumulative relative frequency and then we graph it on a cumulative relative frequency graph. The other types of frequency graphs that we looked at were histograms, but this one is definitely a line graph, not a histogram. And the thing that it allows us to do is to easily pick out the mean I'm sorry, not the mean, the median, the Q1, and the Q3, therefore also the interquartile range, because we can use the percentages, 25th percentile for Q1, 50th percentile for Q2, or the median, and 75th percentile for the Q3. There's an example on page 87 and 88 of your textbook about Barack Obama and how he fit in in terms of his age at inauguration with the other presidents. And you can see from this graph that his age at age 47, was he unusually long, young? Well, let's take a look at age 47. Now, age 47 falls where the arrow is indicated on the ogive and what we do is we trace back to the, ax the vertical axis and we see that that's in the 11th percentile. So he was very young. He was older than only 11% of presidents at inauguration. Okay, what about the 65th percentile? Well, what we do is we kind of go in the opposite direction then. We find the 65th percentile on our vertical, trace over to the ogive, and trace down so that we can see what, the, what age the 65th percentile represents. And it represents 58 years of age at inauguration. Z-scores. This is a new measurement that we haven't talked about. What it does is it counts standard deviations away from the mean and it's sensitive to direction. So if an, a, an individual is below, the value is below the mean, then we're going to have a negative z-score. And if it's above the mean, we're going to have a positive z-score. So it's going to indicate both how many standard deviations away from the mean and the direction.
the way that we calculate the z-score is the individual data point x minus the mean for the the in the variable divided by the standard deviation okay so back to Jenny's example she got an 86 on her test if the class mean is 80 and the standard deviation is 6.07 then her standardized score is 0.99 what does that mean well it's positive that means she scored above the mean and it's almost one that means her score is one standard deviation above the mean score on that test on page 91 of your book there's another example using Jenny and this time she has an eight she still has an 86 on her statistics test but this time she found out that she has a score of 82 on her chemistry test the chemistry test scores also had a fairly symmetric distribution this time the mean was 76 and there was a standard deviation of four that's four points okay the standard deviation is going to be in the same units as the mean on which test did she perform better relative to the rest of her class so we already did the example of her statistics test in the chemistry test we can see that she's 1.5 above the mean that means relative to her peers she did Jenny did much better on her chemistry test than she did on her statistics test okay let's talk about transforming data transforming data is when you're performing a linear transformation and when you're doing that, what happens to the shape, center, and spread of a distribution? This might be, for example, changing from inches to feet, something like that. That would be one type. The first type of transformation we're going to look at is just adding or subtracting a constant. So think of it this way. Let's say you take a test in AP Statistics, and your teacher decides to, once she sees the scores, give everyone a 10-point bump. That would be taking all of the values and just adding 10 points to each individual value. So if we were to do that, what would happen? We would find that the measurements of center, the mean and the median, would change. We would see a different value. Also, the quartiles, the Q1, the Q3, three and the maximum and minimum of course would also change so all the numbers in our five number summary and the measurements of center would all change by that 10 points but the measurements of spread the IQR the range and the standard deviation would not change because the differences in the data the differences between the data points I should say doesn't change so we see the linear transformation of the data would have an impact on the measures of center but not on the measurements of spread. There's an example in your textbook on page 93 and it's all about estimating room width. So some students estimated room width and they realized they made an error. So the the one the graph that you the dot plot that you see on the bottom is their original the one on the top is the one that was shifted over in order to correct for the error in, in measurement or the, in estimation that they made and you can see that both of them are identical the shape is the same and the spread is the same but you can clearly see also that if we were to find the values for the five number summary which includes the median and the mean if we were to calculate the mean both of those numbers would be different and that you can see if you need to look at it for a little bit longer pause the video and take a look at the numerical summaries alright so transforming data if you're adding or subtracting mean median change measurements of center change but measurements of spread do not change what about when you multiply or divide well that's going to be a little bit different when we multiply or divide by a specific number and this is along the lines of what I was saying before the example if we have something in inches and we convert it to feet or feet and we're converting to inches both of those examples would require multiplication or division you know division is the inverse operation of multiplication um, in those we would see that measurements of center and spread would both change the shape of the distribution doesn't change overall but the spread increases so the numbers become further apart and the the values for the numerical summary the five number summary and also the mean would change
and if you need to again pause the video so that you can take a look if you're curious about this it's definitely worth it to put some numbers in your calculator and see what happens just a quick word about z-scores z-scores are standardized values so what would happen if you graphed the original data and then calculated the z-scores and then graphed the z-scores what would happen is the shape of the distribution would be the same as the original if the shape would not change you would describe it with the same g sox terminology the difference is that you would see would be in the center because you are using a different scale instead of using whatever values or whatever units your original values were in you're now using measurements of standard deviation so that would change and the spread would not change either you would see different numbers but the the appearance of it and the difference between the data points would be exactly the same okay let's talk a little bit about density curves density curves can come in lots of different shapes and sizes and whenever you're talking about quantitative data, so all of the chapters in which we're using quantitative data, which is most of them, you're always going to draw a graph because you want to be able to analyze it. And you have a much better feel for it if you can see, is there a skew? Is it symmetric? And you're always going to want to come up with the numerical summary because it also helps you understand what the what's going on in that data. Sometimes we see that there are so many different values that we start to have a smooth curve. Not all the time. Sometimes it looks like a histogram with lots of different bars, but sometimes we start to see a smooth curve because we have so many different bars. All right, let's, let's get to the rules of density curves. Density curves are always on or above the horizontal axis. The area under the curve is exactly one and it describes the overall pattern of the distribution. We've been talking about distributions and what they look like. So density curves help us to describe and get a feel for and make calculations. So I want you to take a look at that. You can see if we put a curve over the histogram, it gives us the overall shape of the distribution. So we kind of, it's kind of like a shorthand way of looking at the histogram. Okay, pause the video now so you can read the cartoon. Hopefully that gave you a little bit of a chuckle. Uh, we will not be grading on such a curve, by the way. And when we describe density curves, we're going to need to know, and we, we started to look at this in the chapter one where we looked at the relationship between the median and mean on a curve. So the median is seen as the equal areas point. It's halfway through the number of data points. So half of the data is above, half of the data is below. The mean, however, we look at as the balance point. So imagine that the curve is, is sitting on a ruler. Where would we be able to balance the ruler is more or less where we're looking for the mean. Okay? And we, we already talked about the mean and the median are going to be at the same location or very close to one another if we have a symmetric or approximately symmetric distribution. If we have a skewed distribution, then the mean is going to be pulled toward the tail in the distribution. So we have an example here, two examples I should say. The one on the left, we have an approximately symmetric, looks pretty symmetric to me, distribution mean and median are in the same place. But in the one on the right, we have a right skewed distribution. The mean is pulled to the tail or to the right of the curve, and the median kind of splits the area in half. All right, so these are the things that we learned in section 2.1. We're going to get back together again in section 2.2 when we will start to talk about normal distributions.